Welcome to Lunch of the Lord. I'm Pastor Mark, and we are continuing our series of studies on the Tabernacle of Moses. This lesson is part number 10, and we are looking at the Ark of the Covenant. And we will be taking two lessons on the Ark of the Covenant, this lesson and the next. Actually, the next lesson we will be finishing our study on the Ark of the Covenant and also finishing our study on the Tabernacle of Moses. So this lesson we begin uh, part number 10 in this series on the Tabernacle of Moses and we look at the Ark of the Covenant. Now we turn to Exodus chapter 25 and we're going to read verses 10 through 16. And it says here, And they shall make an ark of shittim wood, two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. And you shall overlay it with pure gold, within and without shall you overlay it, and shall make upon it a crown of gold, round about and you shall cast four rings of gold for it and put them in the four corners thereof and two rings shall be on the one side of it and two rings on the other side of it and you shall make staves of shittim wood and overlay them with gold and you shall put the staves into the rings by the sides of the ark and the, that the ark may be born with them. The staves shall be in the rings of the ark. They shall not be taken from it. And thou shalt put into the ark the testimony which I shall give thee. Now, of all the pieces of furniture that were used for the tabernacle, the ark is the first one mentioned. All other pieces of furniture were of no value without the ark. And yet, all the other pieces of furniture derived their purpose and their importance from the ark. So, the ark of the covenant, when God gave instructions to Moses to build a tabernacle, God begins not from the outside working in. God begins right from the very heart of this tabernacle, the ark, the ark of the covenant. And it's, it's the very, God begins right at the very presence of Almighty God and he starts from within and works out. The work, I'm sorry, the value, what value did the tabernacle have? when the children of Israel took the ark from it to help them fight with the Philistines. Remember, the first lesson on the history of the tabernacle, we said that uh, the children of Israel were at war with the Philistines. The Philistines came up against the children of Israel. We're going to fight the, the children of Israel. They were, uh, the children of Israel were afraid so they went and they took the ark from the tabernacle of Moses. They go to, to the tabernacle, they grab the ark, and they take it out. And as we said in that first lesson, never again, never again did the ark of the covenant ever return back to the tabernacle of Moses. It, it never returned there again. The Philistines defeated the Israelites. The Philistines took the ark. And, and then uh, a while later, the Philistines sent the ark back to the children of Israel. And you would think that the children of Israel would bring it back to the tabernacle, but it never did. It never went back there. And, you know, the children of Israel still continued to worship God at the tabernacle but they worship there without the ark being there and which means that they they had a form of worship but the presence of god was not there 
And you know, this is the way it is today in many churches throughout the world. You could go to, there's many churches in the world and you could go there and at the front, at, at, the, at the doorway of that church, over top of the doorway, you could write Ichabod. You could write Ichabod. The presence of God is not there. They worship God in their own way. I'm going, this, this is how we worship God. They don't want God telling them how, how to worship him. They'll worship God how they think it, how they think. And, you know, many, many uh, people go to churches and the presence of God is not there. Presence of God is not there. The ark is gone. It's a form of worship. It's, it's a building. It's, it's a structure. But the presence of God is not there. The work of salvation never begins with man or anything from this world system. God made the first step. Concerning salvation, God made the first step in, in, the God, in his plan for salvation. Romans chapter 3 verse 11 says, There is none that seeks after God. No one seeks after God. Psalm 51 verse 5, we were all at, we were all shapen in iniquity and we were conceived in sin. In Psalm 58 verse 3, 58 verse 3 says, the wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies. And Isaiah chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. Why should you be stricken any more? You will revolt yet more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot even unto the head there, there is no soundness in it but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Remember, remember, it was the shepherd that went after the lost sheep. It was God who appeared to Abraham after Abraham was out of fellowship with God for 13 years. If you go to Genesis, Genesis chapter 16, and the very last verse, verse 16, Genesis 16, 16, and then very next verse, chapter 17, verse 1, there's a 13-year gap between those two chapters. 13 years where Abraham was out of fellowship with God. And in chapter 17, verse 1, it wasn't Abraham who said, hey, I think, you know, it's been 13 years now. I think I'll go after God again. No, no, no. It was God who, who approached Abraham. It was God who came to Abraham. It was God who appeared to Moses in the burning bush. It was God who confronted David about his sin with Bathsheba and Uriah. It wasn't David. David didn't say, you know, uh, this has been, it's been a year now since I've had, uh, I've talked with God and had fellowship with him since that sin with Bathsheba and, and Uriah. I, th I think I'll start seeking God. No, 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 <laughs> no, no. It wasn't David seeking after God. It was God who came to David. And in your life, it was God who appeared to us one day and we gave our hearts to him. And let me say this, if anybody is seeking God, it's because God approached them first, okay? People don't just wake up in the morning and say, I, I think I'll seek God. <laughs> now, that doesn't happen, right? People do not roll out of bed and say, you know what? This is a wonderful uh, sunny day. I think I'll, I think I'll seek after God today. No, no. No, no, that's, that, that's not part of our nature to seek after him. So if anybody says, I'm seeking after God and, and, and the, the true God, it's because God has, God has taken the first step 
and prompted them to seek him. All right? Remember, God is the one. That's why it's the ark. The ark in the plan in God's in God's magnificent plan of salvation, it was God who took the first step, not man, not man. And the ark of the covenant is the first the first thing that God describes in this tabernacle of Moses. It's God's presence first. Now, in Exodus chapter 25, verse 10, we see the, the dimensions of this uh, Ark of the Covenant. It says here, And they shall make an ark of shittim wood. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. So, this is interesting because you usually think of the Ark of the Covenant as just this box, you know, about so big. But when you figure the dimensions, it's actually it's actually a, a chest, like a, a rectangle chest, because two and a half cubits long is 45 inches. So it's almost four feet long. All right? The, 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 the ark the ark of the covenant is almost four feet long and it's 27 inches wide and it's 27 inches high again as i said in uh, previous lessons that the average table i think in fact the table that i'm sitting at right here is approximately 30 inches high i think that's the standard height for tables is about 30 inches somewhere around 30 inches well these these uh, specifications is that the height of the the uh, ark is that it's 27 inches high, all right, just a just a little bit lower than our standard height of a table. So it's 45 inches long, almost four feet long, two, uh, 27 inches uh, wide, and 27 inches high. Now verses 10 through 16 of Exodus 25 are describing a hollow box. All right? It's describing a hollow box, a box with four sides and a bottom, but no top to it. All right? Now, there are no directions to make feet for this ark, for this box that's being built. All right? So, therefore, it seems that it was placed directly on the ground. God never gave directions to put feet on this ark. So more than likely, it was set directly on the ground. Now the materials of this ark is that it was, of course, made of shittim wood, which speaks of Christ's incorruptible and his sinless humanity. And... It was overlaid with pure gold, which also speaks of Christ's divinity. So it was the it was made of shittim wood, and the shittim wood was overlaid with gold, and it speaks all of Christ, his perfect humanity, that he came, he he had a human body, he came and, and indwelled a human body, and he had a he lived a perfect life. And yet he was also he was he was 100% human, but sinless human, but also 100% God. Now, the, the crown and the rings and the staves. The crown that went around the top of the box was to be of gold. So you have this, this box without a top. And at the top of this box, around all around the edge, there was this crown, and this crown was to be made of gold all around the rim of the, the box. And there were four rings of gold made to go on the four corners. Now, two rings on each side to be used in order to carry this ark. So there were four rings, one on each corner, and then they would take these staves. There were two staves that were made, and of course they were made of shittim wood, and they were overlaid with gold. Now, no direction was given as to how long these staves should be. All right? 
but they had to they had to be long enough to go through the rings and also be long enough so that somebody could one of the priests could carry it on their shoulders so there, again there's no directions the exact length of these staves but they were long enough to for that at each end of the stave it could carry this ark of the covenant now verse 15 is very interesting it says here in uh, Exodus 25 verse 15 and the staves shall be in the rings of the ark now listen the next part's very important they show you're going to take the staves and you're going to put them in the rings of the ark and they shall not be taken from it not like the other pieces of furniture that had staves and you would carry them and then you would pull them out when you're done and store them somewhere and then when you're ready to move you would put the staves back in and carry right no with the ark there was none of that taking the staves out and storing them somewhere the staves the staves were to never be taken from the ark they were to be there permanently when when Moses and Aaron whoever whoever it was after the staves were completely made they were overlaid with gold whoever it was who put those staves into those rings all right and one on each side once they were there they were to never be taken out and I'm, we're talking we're talking however many hundreds of years they were to stay there permanently never to be taken out now as we said the ark of the covenant was a hollow box but on top of the ark we have the mercy seat and the mercy seat which go which covers this this box is seen in Exodus 25 verses 17 through 22 so it says here in verse 17 and you shall make a mercy seat of pure gold two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof so it's the exact dimensions of the top of the ark all right and thou shalt you shall make two cherubims of gold of beaten work shall you make them in the two ends of the mercy seat and make one cherub on one end and the other cherub on the other end even of the mercy seat shall you make the cherubims on the two ends thereof and the cherubims shall stretch forth their wings on high covering the mercy seat with their wings and their faces shall look one to another toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubims be and you shall put the mercy seat above upon the ark and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee and there I will meet with thee and I will commune with thee and above the mercy seat from, sorry from above the mercy seat from between the two cherubims which are upon the ark of the testimony of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel so now this is the top the lid <laughs> if you want to say the lid of the box God's describing the cover for this ark of the covenant now again it's the same length and the same width as the ark and it was to be made of pure gold no shit and wood involved it was to be made of pure gold no thickness was given which symbolizes that God's mercy is as deep as we need it to be now was it humongously thick <laughs> probably not no but but it was thick enough to hold the weight of the cherubims and really the only other thing that would go on the mercy seat would be the sprinkling of the blood on the mercy seat so it wasn't that it had to hold a lot of weight um, so the thickness of it is not given but again we symbolize that as meaning that God's grace and God's mercy towards us is as thick as we need it to be it's as deep as our sins are deep 
and, and it goes to the depths of, 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 of our being. And, and it's, our sin is never deeper than the mercy and the grace of God. On top were two, were to be two cherubims of gold, and they were to be made of beaten work. Now, one at each end facing each other with their wings covering the mercy seat and their faces shall be looking down on the mercy seat. Now, so their wings would be over top and touching, touching the other uh, cherubim's wings, but their face would be down looking at the mercy seat. That's important. In 1 Peter chapter 1, let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 1, because if you'd like, you can uh, pull up my lessons on 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 12, and it explains the, explains it also. You can look on my series of lessons on 1 Peter, pull up chapter 1, verse 12. And it says here, Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Spirit uh, sent sent down from heaven. What? Which things, which things the angels desire to look into? The angels desire to look into. And we spoke on that in the series of lessons on First Peter is that the angels are desiring to look into mercy. Now, the angels are longing to, the, to see mercy this side of God's character called grace. Why? Because, because they, they didn't be, because until sin happened, they had no idea what grace was, what mercy was. All right. Now it says here, the, the Greek word for desire is they desire to look into is epithumia. And it's a strong craving. It means a strong craving, a longing. So here are these, these cherubims that are looking down at the mercy seat represent the angelic host. You have to understand that. The cherubims, these two cherubims of beaten work represent the angelic host in heaven. And they, they are longing. They have a strong craving to look into something. All right. And to look the Greek word here is para, uh, paracupto, and it means they to lean forward, to stoop. So it's 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 a picture of these angels are looking. They're 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 stretching forward to look and to see what this what this thing mercy is called. What is this mercy all about? What's grace mean? Be as I said before sin. There was no reason for God to show grace or mercy or forgiveness or sacrifice. There was no need. There was, there was no rebellion in, in heaven in eternity past before sin came into being. There was no, no negativity whatsoever. So, but yet inside the very nature of God, there was mercy. There was grace. There was sacrifice. There was forgiveness, but it was never expressed out of his being because there was there, there was never an opportunity. And then Satan fell and, and Adam and Eve got infected with the sinful nature. They they rebelled against God. And now all of a sudden, God the the ex, God's mercy and God's grace part a side of God's character was beginning to be shown toward humanity that the angelic world had never seen before. They, they didn't know what mercy was. They didn't know what forgiveness was. They never, they never, they had no idea what grace really was. Maybe they knew grace, but they never saw it in action. Maybe they did know what mercy was. Maybe they knew, oh yeah, this is mercy, but they never saw it in action. Now, when mankind sins and, and, and God is providing a plan of salvation to give, to give mankind 
a provision to come to heaven and to spend eternity with him, God now has an opportunity toward mankind to express grace and mercy and forgiveness. And the angels were, they were excited. You, from, from the Greek, you can tell, they're excited. They want to see what is this thing called grace? What is this thing called mercy and forgiveness and sacrifice? We've never seen it before. And, and, and the, the cherubims, that's why their angel, their, their heads are, are looking down towards the mercy seat. They want to see mercy, the, the, the grace of God. Now, there's, we're going to finish with this lesson with four points concerning the mercy seat. Number one, it was a place of meeting. In Exodus chapter 25, verse 22, it says, And there I will meet with you, and I will commune with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims, which are upon the Ark of the Covenant, the, the Ark of the Testimony. So it was a place of meeting. God said that he would meet with mankind there at the mercy seat, not anywhere else in, in the tabernacle, not anywhere else in the world. God said, I will meet with mankind. Where? At the mercy seat, at the mercy seat. Number two, it was a place where God rested. It's called a mercy seat, a mercy seat. And it means that God's rested. God is resting from his work. And it is at the mercy seat where mankind finds rest with from the effects of sin and rest with God through the work of Christ. You know, when we come to Christ and we give our hearts to him and, and, and our fight, our fight, <laughs> Our fight against God is all over. The blood has been shed. And, 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 and we have given our hearts to Christ. He, he's defeated us. God, <laughs> the war is over. Our fight with God is over. We've given up. And God has defeated us. And now we come to him humble. And, and, and we, we, we cry out to him, God, have mercy on me. And God is more than willing to forgive us and to cleanse us from our unrighteousness, cleanse us from our sin. And, and God, God is resting. The work is done. The blood has been shed. The blood has been put on the mercy seat. And God is resting there. And that's where we meet. And when we approach God, when we come to God at the mercy seat, that's where we find our rest. That's where we find our rest with God's presence. God now, God now rests with us and we rest. We don't have to be afraid of the mercy seat. There's no, there's no fear at the mercy seat. There's, there's, there's nothing there to be afraid of. God is there waiting for us. He's resting. His work is done. And, and we go to the mercy seat and we find our rest from fighting against God. We find our rest in the presence of Almighty God. Number three, it is the place that God said that he would commune with us. In Exodus chapter 25, verse 22, he says, And I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat. You know, God speaks to us. God speaks to us and he instructs our lives from the place of the finished work, the place of rest. You know, when God communicates to us in our lives and God speaks to us and and, and when God moves in our heart, the Holy Spirit is illuminating truths. You know what? That's coming from the mercy seat. God's communing to us from the mercy seat. It's a place of communion where God, God talks to us and God instructs our life. God guides us in our life and he's talking with us. And, and, and we can talk to him. We can pray to him. That's what the incense was for. 
and when 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 the high priest would go in uh, to to the to sprinkle the blood once a year, he would take that censer in with him, and he would burn incense. And Bible says God said that there must be a cloud of incense on over top of. The, on the mercy seat, over the mercy seat, and sprinkle the blood. If the cloud's not there, it's no good, no good. There has to be a cloud. Prayer, we can talk to God there. God talks to us. There's a communicating, there's a communion with God, a fellowship with God between the cherubims. It's a place of communion where God speaks to you from between the cherubims. And you, you find rest. God's resting there also. Finally, number four. This is, this is beautiful. It's the place. Listen, listen now. The mercy seat is the place where blood and mercy came in contact with each other. It's the place where the mercy, the character of God was touched with, with blood. With, with, with a sacrifice. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, God allowed himself to be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. And God allowed his character of mercy to be touched by the ultimate sacrifice of a victim. It's amazing that that the character of God, it, it, the mercy seat, is where where it's not just it's not just a mercy seat with nothing. No, it's a mercy seat. God's God's mercy is to be touched by the blood of a victim. And you know, God's heart, the heart of God, can be touched with our sacrifice, with 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 our full commitment unto him where we lay down our lives and we die to ourself and, and, and we receive the righteousness of God. God's mercy can be touched with by the, was touched by the blood of a sacrifice. All right. Next lesson, uh, our final lesson on the tabernacle of Moses and also the next lesson on the Ark of the Covenant. We're good dealing, we're going to be dealing with the contents of the Ark of the Covenant. All right. So until then, have a great day. Walk with the Lord. I know he walks with you.